SoFi stock, the time has come. Earnings are Tuesday morning. I want to speak about SoFi in this video here today. So I want to speak about what my expectations are for earnings. Do I think they're going to blast higher? Do I think they're going to beat on these revenue numbers, these EPS numbers? What do I think the probabilities are? Kind of my expectations as far as all that goes. And, uh, you know, let's, let's talk a little bull case, bear case. You know, if they beat very nicely on numbers, where do I see the stock? What if they miss? Where do I see the stock? Those sorts of things. So we'll get into all that at the top of this video here, okay? Then we're going to go ahead and uh, react to this one. I want to react to this AMD earnings video here because AMD earnings are coming very soon. So I thought that would be an interesting one, by the way. It's just a huge week in general for earnings. I mean, absolutely nuts. Rotation of small caps means we are likely going to see a slowdown. I want to react to this. Greg Branch, he's honestly been like bearish tone for like two years plus now at this point in time so looking forward to kind of hearing him and then dexcom stock plummeting i thought we'd watch this and react to this because this is a company that is it been pretty successful over time but their stock price just fell 40 percent 40 percent in a day so i want to go ahead and react to that share my opinions and perspectives appreciate y'all joining me as always thanks so much for being here folks thank you for being subscribed to the channel new all-time high subscribers i think we're getting close to forty-eight thousand. i think something like that so appreciate y'all always being here so so far uh, i mean to start off right off the bat okay so the company in their last quarter they beat on eps right eps normalized actual they beat by three cents on uh, a gap basis, they beat by one cent. They beat on revenue as well. If we look over the last several quarters, they've been beating pretty consistently recently, right? As far as revenue, they've beat every single quarter for basically as long as the company's been a public company. It's absolutely incredible. They consistently beat in regards to revenue. And then in regards to earnings per share, they've only missed EPS, it looks like, one time in you know basically the, the past many 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 quarters and if we look at the two most recent earnings they beat by 22 million they beat by 21 million as far as revenue they beat by two cents and beat by one cent for earnings per share right and then if we go ahead and look at what is expected here for sofi if we can pull that up the expectations are not exactly the highest so we should be looking at quarterly now for this June quarter that's about to report. Earnings per share estimates, uh, zero cents they have. That's insane. Uh, <laughs> you know, just insane. And then they have $566 million as far as revenue, 15% growth. So at the end of the day, do I think SoFi is going to beat both these line items come earnings? The answer is yes, I do. I do believe SoFi is going to beat. I, I believe analysts have gone way too bearish, in my opinion, in regards to EPS and revenue. Also, watching Anthony Noto, Anthony Noto went on CNBC, that was probably, what, two or three weeks ago. Anthony Noto seemed incredibly confident, incredibly confident. I think if we had misses coming here, I think Anthony Noto would not have seemed that confident. If you watch that interview on CNBC, I think I reacted to it on this reaction channel, right? He seemed incredibly confident. And so usually if you're a CEO and you miss some numbers, you're, you know, you're not quite, uh, you know, saying it with your chest out. Let's put it that way. The other thing I like about SoFi into these earnings, so now we can talk about kind of stock price reactions, things like that, right? So if you look at this stock, Ford P, sure, it looks expensive. But remember, this is a company that's been consistently beating. So it's very high probability they're going to keep beating in regards to earnings per share. And that Ford P might not be nearly as high as we think it is. But look at the two-year Ford P, 23. And you think about the growth SoFi has. You know, I think the valuation is way too cheap in regards to this company. Once you get past this year, once you start getting into 25, I think the valuation is way too cheap. So people have kind of de-risked out of these sorts of stocks. But the other thing is the stock is setting up for kind of a prime time situation. So if we look at SoFi stock just over, you know, the last bit of time here. So let's say like the last three weeks or so. Last three weeks, it's up about 18%. If we pull up a one month on the stock, it's up 15%, right? And then a five day, it's down about 2%. And then obviously it went up about 2% uh, on Friday trading. But the overall trend is certainly higher recently in regards to SoFi. And a lot of people want to play these sorts of stocks. Look at also the Russell. If we were to pull up the Russell right next to um, right next to SoFi here, look at these babies right next to each other. It kind of goes to show you people are looking to position into some of these, right? It goes into the rotation that's going on in the market. You look at IWM up 12%. 
in the past month. SoFi is up about 15.5% in the past month, right? So this is these are the sorts of stocks people are looking to get into now at this point in the market. And so as long as that trend continues, uh, SoFi should blast a lot higher. Now, where do I see the stock? If they come out and do a double beat, if they come out double beat, the conference call's really good, I could see the stock moving to $9, $10 after earnings, essentially, Okay. Now, let's say there's a scenario and they miss, bad conference call, sounds worrisome, something like that. Where do I see the stock going to on the downside? I would see the stock going in that sort of bearish situation. I would see it going down to like 675, something like that, like something back in the high sixes again. If we had some sort of worrisome conference call, some misses on numbers, something like that. But the misses on numbers probably aren't coming. Is a conference call going to be good or scary? Anthony Noto just went on CNBC like two weeks ago. Or, like, it's going to be good. Like, the conference call is going to be good. Anthony Noto is going to be confident. He just spoke confidently about what's going on with SoFi's business and what he sees for the business. So the conference call is likely going to be good, and they're likely going to beat numbers. So therefore, being that people also want to position these stocks, we're likely going to see a much higher stock price. But you never know. Personally, as somebody that's been buying the stock, I would rather have the stock be a little lower here uh, in the short term, because I would love to grab some more shares of SoFi. I have a small position in the public account. I think it's like, I want to say 20 something thousand dollars, which the public counts over $2 million. So I'm going to pull it up here on, on my phone. And two, uh, the public counts over $2 million, So if it's a $20,000 position, it's basically about 1% of my portfolio. And that feels about right. And the thing with SoFi is I don't like any financials usually. So my SoFi position, I have 3,000, I have 3,100 shares. So as of right now, it's a $22,900 position. So it's about 1% of the public count. The thing with me is I don't like owning financials. I don't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not a bank owner. I'm not a financials owner. I just don't like those sorts of stocks. So for me to even own SoFi is like, I've got to really see potential there because these are not my favorite stocks. Not my favorite stocks at all. So yeah, when I own SoFi, guys, it's kind of a, it's it's very bullish. I would just <laughs> call it that for for financials overall because it's not you know I don't usually do this. Only the other two financials I've ever owned in history. J P Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and that's 15 years of investing. So if I buy a financial, you know, I'm just gonna say it's. Uh, you know, it's got to be something special there, okay? So next one up here, AMD earnings. Let's get into this one. In those reports, let's bring in Bernstein, Stacey Raskin. Stacey, great to see you. Good to be here, thanks. What was it specifically in By your... By the way, if you have any opinion on SoFi, if you think they're going to beat earnings, miss earnings, let me know in the comment section. I'd love to always hear from you guys if you feel like you got a good insight or take in regards to uh, SoFi's earnings coming up here. Out of Alphabet's report that got NVIDIA and other chip investors nervous. Yeah, it was it was the capex, and don't get me wrong, the capex guide was good, but they didn't raise it. Like uh-huh. the quarter after came in, I think a little higher than than what they'd suggested, and they said it would sort of sustain at some very high levels through the year, but they didn't raise it, and so that hit some of the AI stocks. And then the broader space was getting hit. Just, I mean, we've had some reports. Most of the reports haven't been very good, <laughs> so um, right. that's that's kind of you know it it, it has consequences. So in terms of Microsoft and Amazon next week, is it is it key that they actually raise CapEx at this point, or has that sort of concern been, been erased with the sellout that we saw this week? I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly would be nice if they did, but we're still kind of early in the year. Like, they, they, they just raised really big, like, recently, so I mean, we probably got some time as we go through the year, but um, obviously it would be helpful. <laughs> I, just, I don't know if we're going to get it yet. That's all. Stacey, thanks so much for being here. As you yeah. look as you look forward to next week, what do you think? It- by the way, Google reported earnings this week. Earnings are great, by the way. If I recall, I gave them either an A or an A minus for their earnings. Um, I graded that and put it in the uh, private group Discord chat. But Google, I gotta say, guys, to be completely honest, is looking really attractive to me. Really attractive, like. To the point where I'm like, I should start a Google position. <laughs> I really should. I like what's going on here in regards to Google. So especially after those earnings with that income statement the company has, the balance sheet that company has. Whoo, man. I don't know. I'm really considering like starting a, a Google position. We'll see. The problem is right now there's so many stocks out there that I think are great deals, great values. 
that's a difficult thing in this market to be quite frank. So, mm, mm, mm. by the way, pin comment down there today. I'll put thousand X in the private group. If you're looking to apply to join my private group, as well as get access to full thousand X and all the different features there, I'll put that as the pin comment down there. So you can hopefully level up your game to a much higher level than where you're at in the market right now. Larger story, more economic data overhang or tech stocks delivering on what have been high expectations? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, the, I, I focus on, on the stocks themselves, the semiconductor stocks and the expectations. And, and that's clearly what I'll be looking at. Like the, the, the macro data points and everything are what they are. I, yeah. I mean, broadly for the space, though, kind of what we've been seeing in, in, in general. I mean, we've had a number of the, uh, the analog stocks and some of the equipment stocks go this week. Most of the analogs, you know, they're exposed to industrial and auto, and those people are hoping for, like, recovery in the back half, and most of those markets still don't look super. Um, Semicap's been a little mixed. Uh, we had some of the U.S. guys went. They actually looked okay. We've got it. I think Lamb Research goes next week. Um, and then in my coverage, because I've got Intel and AMD, those are probably, like, the two that people are paying the most attention to um, as, as we go there. And, and they, they've got different things, I think, that people will be, uh, that people will be looking at for each of them. AMD, it'll be all around the AI guide. Intel's got all kinds of stuff that are, that are, that, that's going on there, PCs and servers and, you know, the little bit of AI that they have and margins and just the broader foundry strategy and, and, and the, the process roadmap. In, Intel's juggling a lot of balls right now. Tim? Stacey, it's, it's Tim. So I, I, I'd like to maybe drill a little deeper there, though, because we, we really are seeing within those three names, uh, you know, significant divergence. I, I get why Intel uh, is down 40 percent this year, and I, I get why uh, NVIDIA is up 140. But, but AMD is down 5 percent on the year. Yeah. Um, and again, from an analyst perspective, explain this to me, because they are supposed to be a clear number, too. Um, they have lagged significantly at a time when the markets even were more, more you know, ebullient, uh, I would say, on, on semis. Break that down real quick. Yeah, you, you bet. So I think in general, all of the AI stocks recently have had a little bit of pressure just because expectations have been very high and the numbers have gotten very large and people are starting to think through what is all this money actually going to get spent on, right? And what's the return? And so all of the stocks recently, I think, have, have sold off. AMD has been a little bit interesting, though. You know, they, they have, you know, they are the number two, you know, to some of the, to, to NVIDIA and some of the other players in the space in data center GPUs. Um, Expectations have gone up a lot. You know, the, the company's been sort of raising their AI guidance through the year, but I mean, consensus expectations are already quite a bit above that. And so I think there's a concern that while we probably will get a raise to that outlook, it, it likely will not be enough like to be high to, to cause expectations to go up. Also in the near term with AMD, there's been some worries about potential issues with their products. There's been concerns around uh, their high bandwidth memory that they use with, uh, they, they buy from Samsung mostly concerns about like or is that having issue and is it causing order pushouts or cancellations and so we'll find out i guess you know better next week when they report but those have been some concerns in recent weeks that have been weighing on the stock and and taking it down probably a little worse than maybe even some of the other AI stocks uh, that are that are there wow. karen let's check amd's valuation here AMD. so amd we're looking at about a 39 Ford P, two year out Ford P23. Obviously, the company should have extraordinary earnings per share growth and a very strong revenue growth starting next year. So, you know, I got to say, if we go back three, four months ago, five months ago, I felt like AMD was very overvalued. Now, I like AMD. Under 140, I definitely like AMD. Let's compare AMD kind of versus. Um, Let's compare them versus NVIDIA here. So we got a trillion 12 month PE. Obviously, you know, NVIDIA's business model has been way better than AMD recently, right? But it doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way. But this is where things get interesting because you look at AMD, it looks like a rip off on a trillion 12 month PE basis versus NVIDIA, right? But then you look at the forward P and you're like, oh, okay, forward P is under NVIDIA. And then you look at the two year out forward P significantly under, right? But AMD's got a lot more to prove. NVIDIA's already proven they're, they've won and they're winning, right? So AMD has it. AMD has to prove that. That's what AMD's really going to prove or have to prove over this next two or three quarters, specifically the next two or three quarters. It starts with this quarter they're about to report this week, right? And then going on uh, from there. So, but I got to say, I actually like AMD. Mm-hmm. The net margin's about to come up massively, so don't think they're going to be stuck at a 2% net margin. That net margin's probably going to fly 
to 20 to 30 percent range over the next year or so. So that net margin is about to blast higher. Gross margins likely going to pull up as well. So that's the nice thing with AMD. You're about to get a major profitability story, major revenue story, but you're also simultaneously about to get a big margin story here. <sighs> hmm. It's a buy. It's a buy. Ah. Yeah. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for being on. It's a so, really good. I'll turn to Nvidia yeah. for a minute. I gotta be honest. That's a really freaking good setup. Like, oh my gosh. Last quarter, talking Damn. about Blackwell being here sooner than people thought. That seemed to be part of the, you know, the big upside surprise. Do you think they need to just continue to deliver catalysts like that, or what are you expecting, sort of, big picture from them? Yeah. Yeah, no, no. They, so the, the worry going into last quarter was, you know, a transition air pocket. They're on an architecture right now that's known as Hopper. They're moving to Blackwell and people were worried about like an air pocket and demand in between. And they last quarter, at least they kind of took that off the table. They suggested that Hopper demand was so strong and that we would have material amounts of Blackwell as we got into the end of the year. And I don't know that I'm expecting to hear anything different than that. Um, you know, clearly, again, expectations are, are high and like the numbers need to go up. And I actually think the numbers will be fine, although I, I always joke, like, I think you could hand me the earnings report right now. I'm not exactly sure I could tell you what the stock would do the next day. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think in general, the overall environment for AI spending, it's, it's the one area, actually, that still looks very, very robust. I know everybody's worried about sustainability. I understand those worries broadly. I don't think the time to worry, though, is just yet. If there's one stock, everybody should root to go down this week. I'll just be honest with you guys. I mean, you know, maybe a few stocks, but if there's one stock, everybody should root to go down this week. It is AMD, honestly. I think everybody should root for AMD to go down because I'm looking at that setup and I really like that setup for the next couple years. I mean, when you think about margin expansion, net margins, gross margin expansion, they're going to have considerable over the next couple years. They should have nice revenue upside over the next few years, along with very nice earnings per share uh, upside over the next few years. Oh, ho, 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 baby. The setups are actually phenomenal in regards to AMD. So, yeah, I mean, if, every, if anybody should root for something to go down, root for AMD. Uh, Meta is reporting this week. Meta's looking really good. Amazon's reporting. Apple's reporting. You know, maybe I'll speak about those maybe on the main channel tomorrow or something like that. Rotation of small caps mean uh, we are likely to see a slowdown. Performer again this week. Once again, as I, as I said at the beginning of this video, remember this gentleman has definitely, I've watched his commentary for the last couple of years, he's definitely sounded a uh, bearish bear over the last couple of years. Finishing up 3.5% on the week, third straight week of gains for the small caps. Do we have legs here? I don't think so. And I don't think so, meaning that the catalyst to reversing or abating some of this uh, small cap outperformance is likely three things. The first is earnings. Leadership is going to be leadership. And we're already seeing that from the communication services and the information technology sector, where we're seeing 150 basis points of net profit, uh, net profit margin expansion, where we saw Alphabet put up 30%, where we're likely to see some of those other names put up earnings that far surpass earnings that we've seen from a broad perspective from other sectors. And that is the expectation. We came into this quarter with communication services looking to put up 20%, with information technology looking to put up around 17%, the top two expected numbers in terms of consensus. The second thing that I think will come into play in terms of this uh, rotation of small caps abating is that we're likely to see a, a slowdown. And we can argue or debate or, or, or presume the magnitude and the duration of it, and it's probably softer than many of us imagined weeks ago, but it's still likely to happen. And so the Fed's announcements thus far abate some of the balance sheet risk to smaller names, but it doesn't remove any of the hazard in terms of top line growth or bottom line growth. Mm -hmm. That's likely to be consumption driven. And so we have to go through that slowdown. We'll see leadership reemerge from an earnings growth and margin perspective. And then when they do start to cut rates, it will be much, much slower than the pace at which they raise rates. Okay. So it will take time for some of those hazards to pass us by. Okay. So you're not. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold your horses for just one flip and flapjack and moment, okay? Listen, if the, when the Fed starts lowering rates, which probably is in the next couple months, okay? Okay, they start lowering. 
we don't know how fast they're going to lower. That's just reality. You can assume something's going to happen, but your assumption is likely wrong significantly. No different than when the Fed finally started raising, no one had any clue how high the Fed was going to go. Every single per there's not one person on Wall Street that I had seen that had predicted where the Fed was going to go with Fed funds rate. Not one. No one Wall Street firm, not one analyst, no one predicted the Fed was going to move to 5% plus that quickly. I didn't see anybody predict that. And so, and it happened, right? So now to try to assume you're going to know how fast or slow the Fed's going to lower interest rates, that depends upon so many various factors. What happens with inflation? What happens with the economy? What happens with the jobs market? Right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of things at play there. And so, yeah, I, I think it's dangerous I, I mean, when I look out there, yeah, I do think the Fed's going to start lowering very soon, but I'm not going to bank anything on how fast or slow I think the Fed's going to lower rates. Because I'm just telling you, you're, you're not going to be accurate whatsoever. The Fed doesn't even know. The Fed doesn't even have the first clue about where Fed funds rate's going to be a year from now. The Fed, Jerome Powell himself, has no conception of where the Fed funds rate will be one year from now, especially two years from now. Two months from now? Sure. It, a little bit of pun intended. Drew, want to want to get your thoughts on on this rotation we've seen, how sustainable it is, and on a day where the S and P jumped one percent, it looks like we're closing right around fifty four fifty nine here. Uh, how does this set up for next week, which is going to be the busiest week of earnings for the season? Uh, look, I think the setup for growth is going to be a lot more difficult heading into next week. So me mega cap growth uh, specifically here. So look. It, we can't deny the, the price action there has been really aggressive. Yes, the fundamental momentum has been very good, but at some point you just have to have a little bit of caution when prices move that far ahead of fundamentals. You know, to us, we think growth takes a bit of a pause here. This rotation could have some legs for now, but a lot of these structural winners likely kick in. But look, just to make it real simple, they have to beat in rates. You can't just have one or the other this quarter, especially for the mag seven names that haven't reported yet. Mm, okay. So, Greg, you're basically saying, and you write this. I mean, to be fair, that's what these companies are always basically have to do. They almost always have to beat in rates, <laughs> just to be honest. This isn't the great rotation. It's an overstretched rate cut this rally. What, what would expect. you be buying then if not small caps? So, so I, I think I agree with Drew here. The key, the, the, the secret sauce is what's going to deliver on 20% plus earnings growth. And when, you want to, when, you, when you're banking on 20% plus earnings growth, what you want to see is something tethered to secular tailwinds, generational secu secular tailwinds in the case of, of AI and cloud, et cetera. Or you want to see some structural supply demand imbalance. And so I'm not saying that we haven't picked at the small cap ocean or basket. Uh, what I'm saying is that we're doing it selectively and we're looking for, the, for that uh, sub structural supply demand imbalance or we're looking for a generational secular tailwind. So when you look at shipping, for example, we've talked about how the uh, shipping rates for a 40 foot container from Asia to Europe is five times what it was a year ago. Mm. Well, there's small cap ways to play that and Zim and Matson and yes, they're up a bit this year, but the earnings growth in that sector should be fairly powerful and aggressive throughout this year in 2025 because it takes some time to bring on the capacity. We can talk about for longer term trades, the rotation into green energy, electric vehicles, and while copper has gotten most of the attention in those areas, there's lithium, there's uranium. And so names like Arcadium and NextGen, both under 5 billion, obviously the decreased risk of financial duress, particularly given what they have to invest to acquire and develop their properties. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better access to capital, more widespread access to capital, and be at better terms, obviously, uh, advantages those companies. And at the same time, we have access to that supply, demand, and balance. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, that the surge in demand for those precious metals far outstripped the... Wow, super micro. Super micro, down big. You know, the super micro stock's interesting because recently I was I was under the assumption that the super micro company um, was a company in which the, the valuation was completely out of control. 
But you look, and it's like, no, it's not actually. Toronto 12 month P39, Ford P23, two year old Ford P16, based upon kind of what analysts are expecting here. So the Super Micro is actually really interesting. Very interesting. It's not like a crazy overvalued company like you might assume because the stock went up so much, right? Uh, for projected supply over the next 10 years. All right, let's get into this Dexcom situation because this stock's wild. 40% down in a day. On record, this comes after the diabetes management company reported disappointing revenue for the second quarter and offered weak guidance. Joining us now is Wolf Research Analyst Mike Polark. He has an outperform rating on the stock. Uh, Mike, I'm just going to go right into it here because it came up on the call and it's raised some questions. And that is when you have a company saying that they are short a large number of new pa new patients that they anticipated here for their glucose monitoring for their those products around diabetes. Is this the impact of GLP-1s or is it something else? Um, thanks for having me. In um, bridging their guidance reduction, missing on users was a piece of it. I figure it's about 30% of the overall revenue guidance reduction. Um, mix, uh, revenue per, let's call it pricing, um, was likely the remainder. Um, I don't think it's GLP-1s, and I understand the question. Here's why. We are seeing evidence that uh, patients with type 2 diabetes that do not yet use insulin therapy, so these are folks that could be using GLP-1s. Um, CGM product starts for that patient category accelerated quarter over quarter. Um, so that would be a suggestion that GLP-1s are not disrupting the category. The other bit of evidence we have here um, Dexcom and their competitor Abbott have over the last um, couple quarters presented data around patients on GLP-1s and their use rates of CGMs. And what we find in, in type 2 thus far, patients with type 2 diabetes, the folks that are using GLP-1s are actually using CGM more often, more frequently, more consistently than patients with type 2 that are using oral mm -hmm. medications but not yet GLP-1. So I don't think it's GLP-1s. I do think it's um, more so channel uh, mix and pricing, and, and, and that to me is the greater frustration today. Okay, so you have a buy rating on the stock. Do you buy given the drastic pullback we saw here today? And perhaps just as importantly, how much is this a harbinger for more results we get from medical device makers and healthcare companies that are yet to come? So I will say there was some comforting news um, from another diabetes technology company this morning, Insulate, ticker pod, they pre-announced positive results. Um, so that made me personally feel better that um, we're not going to have some contagion uh, through to the rest of the group, um, the rest of reporting season. Um, as it relates to Dexcom, the stock today, a lot of damage has been done. So, you know, my estimates, my peers' estimates have been reset dramatically. Um, so the expectation, the bar is now quite a bit lower. And on that lower bar at 60 or so dollars per share, I'm seeing a multiple um, 30 times earnings, uh, low 20s times EBITDA. Um, you know, these are multiples that align with a, a company we really like, a stock we really like, Boston Scientific. So we are fans of Boston Scientific. Um, I see Dexcom here trading at Boston Scientific's multiple on newly lowered numbers. And so, so I think that peer comparison helps provide a floor here for the multiple. So I don't cover these stocks, obviously. It's not my uh, sort of industry. But with that being said, I would be suspicious. This is such a violent move down that I feel like some folks know some stuff. Uh, you know, seeing a 40% down move in a day, I feel like there's an existential problem at the company. You know, if you see a stock fall 5, 10, 15%, eh, okay, whatever. 40%? I feel like there's some stuff that's uh, maybe known that there's, there's like existential problems to the company that's going to plague this company for years to go in the future, and it's going to make it hard to get gains. So, you know, that's just kind of like what you got to assume when you see a move down like that. You don't, don't usually trust it. Sometimes it's not a buy the dip opportunity, okay? All right, you guys, appreciate you joining me. As always, thanks so much for being here. Obviously, an insanely busy week uh, this coming week. If you're looking to access my private group, get access to that as well as 1000 You can click the pinned comment down there, fill out an application. Much love and have a great day.